Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, key lawmakers described landmark legislation to improve energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gases. GOP lawmakers propose an off-ramp to end Governor Wall's emergency powers, and the fencing comes down at the Capitol. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. On May 25th, Governor Tim Walz signed the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act of 2021 into law. The bill's author, Senator Jason Rarick, joined me to talk about what the new law means for energy efficiency in Minnesota. Senator David Senjum, a longtime advocate for energy efficiency and also the chair of the Senate Energy and Utilities Committee, called this landmark energy legislation. Certainly congratulations are in order to you for your role in shepherding this through the legislature. How big of a deal is this new law? You know, this is a, a very important, you know, as we all know, our energy future is changing. And I've been a longtime advocate saying we need to get cleaner, cheaper, and still be reliable. And I think this gets us a long way to helping our electric utilities uh, make those transitions and do it in a way that helps keep their grid um, not only efficient, but to stay reliable. And it's these are things that the electric utilities were asking for some reforms they said they needed uh, to be able to continue on with the path they were on and bring on more renewable energy sources um, and keep the grid and their whole system reliable. So I, I do see this as a pretty important piece of legislation to help us in that transition that we know, all know is coming. The new law expands and updates the Conservation Improvement Program, also called SIP. For those who aren't familiar, what is SIP and what kinds of changes are gonna be made? Yeah, so SIP is a program that's been in place for many years. Um, basically what it was uh, dictating was that all of our electric utilities and natural gas companies had to find a one and a half percent efficiency on their system every single year. So becoming more efficient and using less energy every year. And part of that was also that they were required to spend 1.5% of their annual uh, revenue from the previous year on those programs. Uh, the, the great thing about this, you know, that was important when it was first uh, put in to help them advertise, help people become aware of the programs that were in place and why efficiency was so important. I think everybody understands that today. Uh, this bill does away with that required spend if they're meeting their efficiency goals. So I think not only is it going to help us be more efficient, it can actually lower the costs um, of our utility bills in the future. Now, another change um, is the expand in the expansion of SIP is expanding the amount of money that goes to low income households. What does this involve and how does it work? Yeah, a big part of the SIP program through the years has been for the low income in area that we would call weatherization. So it would it helps people with low income be able to afford to add insulation into their homes, replace their windows. Uh, maybe bring in some new technology that's more affordable, but has a high upfront cost that they couldn't afford. So um, all of our electric utilities and natural gas companies were very involved in that. Um, part of the negotiations in this reform was to increase what they're spending um, every year on those programs. Uh, those tend to, you know, tend to be our older homes um, that need these improvements uh, more than uh, new homes. And so this, I think, will really help uh, benefit not only low income, but it helps our utilities become more efficient in their uh, energy system altogether. Well, and that leads really well into my next question. Um, there was a broad array of stakeholders who signed on to this legislation, but the propane industry was not one of them. According to the journal Finance and Commerce, the industry believes that propane will be adversely affected because customers will move to electric heat. You said that you yourself use propane, but the larger question is what this transition to less carbon intensive energy generation will look like, especially for older homes and businesses. It's easy to incorporate these new technologies in new buildings, 
But what about older homes and the expense of making changes? Yeah, and you know that was part of the process um, in bringing this bill together. Um, right now, we know that propane is a cleaner source of uh, energy and it is more efficient than electricity. And it, the bill spells that out, that you cannot change from one type of fuel to another um, unless it is lowering emissions and it is cost effective. And, and for the older homes too, it, it's not cost effective to make the change. And so that's why I just don't believe this is gonna have the negative impact on the propane industry um, that they believed it is going to. Um, there are changes coming, we all know that. And the electrical system is going to reduce emissions and become cleaner in the future. And at some point it will become cleaner than propane. Um, and then that switch would count um, towards the SIP goals. Uh, right now it will not. So, but you know, the older homes, um, little by little we can transition them. But again, part of this, like the weatherization, even if you heat your home with propane, the utilities can come in, help you put in more insulation, put in better windows, and that counts toward their SIP goals because it's helping reduce the amount of propane you need to use to heat your home. And I think that's the overall goal through all of this is to use less energy to heat and cool our homes. There are fuel switching incentives for investor owned utilities and co-ops. Can you provide an example or two of the types of fuel switching that may occur due to these incentives? Yeah, I think two of the most common that you're going to see out there are going to be adding in an air source heat pump um, to supplement. Again, it, the technology still isn't there for Minnesota weather when it gets to be you know below zero, an air source heat pump isn't going to be able to heat your home effectively. But for those spring and fall days, that can be a very good source. So that would be one of the fuel switching measures that might happen. The other one is going to be, we're seeing the, you know, people switch to either hybrid or electric vehicles. And so installing the charging station in your home for an electric vehicle would be one of these fuel switching measures that we would see. So those would probably be the two most common that you would see um, maybe as, you know, other technologies come forward, um, electric heat might become more affordable. You know, we, about 10, 15 years ago, it was popular, but really hasn't lasted. Uh, propane and other sources are still better right now, but technologies may come around that, that we don't know about yet that will offer new technologies in the fuel switching area as well. Now, speaking of new technologies, um, people have said that this law will create jobs. And can you talk a little bit about what kinds of jobs? What do um, young people just graduating from high school or people looking for a career change, what are some opportunities that may be just around the bend? Yeah, you know, a lot of it will be in construction and the service type, like I said, um, coming in to remodel homes, to add insulation, change out windows. Also electricians, the, there are a lot of electrical work um, one of the other improvements that's going to happen over the next uh, number of years is if you have uh, your water heater on a, you know, off peak system or your air conditioner, um, your receiver out on the house, you know, that needs to be updated the, to the new technology that they have to really manage their system better. So that's all work in the construction trades that are really going to uh, benefit from the work created by um, this bill. Now, I think change can be frightening. Is your view one of optimism? And for those who maybe have a little fear and trepidation about the future of energy, what, what, do you, what can you say to them? You know, I, I think uh, I, I understand people who are afraid. Um, I think a lot of times when we jump in and we mandate things, we drive the costs up because we're ahead of technology. I, the, why I got involved with this piece of legislation is it's really looking at following the technology as we move forward. So we're not forcing anything to happen, but we're saying as new technologies emerge, let's allow them to count in these savings goals. Um, I think it's a, it's a great situation for customers and the utilities. Um, it really has the potential of bringing down electric 
utility costs, which we haven't seen in a while. Senator Jason Merrick, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. This week at the Capitol, Republican lawmakers proposed an off-ramp to end Governor Wall's use of emergency powers. If you haven't noticed, uh, everybody's not wearing a mask. You can go to the Twins game and most people don't wear a mask. Uh, the hospitals don't have hardly anybody in them that uh, are, are in there because of COVID. Uh, you cannot say that the emergency is not over. It, it's over. We've been working on this issue all session and really been trying to listen to the governor, the executive branch, and bring forth reasonable solutions. Uh, the governor himself has said in the past month that all he needs is the ability to procure and distribute vaccinations. We're very close in Minnesota to having 70 percent of folks vaccinated, so that's a very good sign. Um, and then he's also said that we want to make sure that we don't put in any jeopardy the federal money that's been flowing to the state um, because of the federal uh, emergency declaration. So we look to solve those two questions that the governor posed. And my bill does that. It's patterned after an Alaska uh, bill that has been tested. So we're not out, not out on a limb here um, with anything that hasn't been done across the country. And it provides the governor um, without emergency powers, the ability to continue to procure and distribute vaccines, and it puts us in a position to continue to receive the federal money. What I don't understand is, and if anybody knows me and has worked with me at the legislature, I have always worked to compromise. I have always worked across the aisle to try and find a way to make things work. If you don't like something in a bill of mine, offer an option. And we will work through it. We'll find a way to make it happen. But to just unilaterally say it doesn't work, I think is outrageous. So we all know that the, legislature, that the emergency is over. There's no reason, like uh, Senator Gazelka said, that we couldn't take the eviction moratorium off-ramp bill and the bill that Representative Haley and I have put together and worked out a way to get through this. Uh, the governor's emergency powers is an issue that we've talked a lot about over the last 15 months uh, in the House. Uh, I think we have voted 19 times to end them uh, with Democrats in the House uh, rebuffing that effort uh, every single time. Um, the reality is uh, the governor does not need the emergency powers. Uh, you see that in other states. Uh, other states, uh, actually there are governors right now giving up their emergency powers voluntarily. And GOP senators and parent advocates made the case for school choice. We absolutely think that education choice, parents' right to choose the different kinds of education that they can have for their kids, must be elevated. Too many kids in Minneapolis and St. Paul and other places are failing. I don't know how anyone that says they care about people of color can just leave them in these failing schools. When they know the schools are failing them, they know that a bad education is a direct pipeline to a life of dependence and crime. And they know they have a chance to vote on education savings accounts that will give the very people that they say they care most about a chance to get out of these schools. How can they just say no? How can they just say no? You have to be trapped. You have to stay in these schools even though 70% of you can't read. We're talking about our most precious of resources our children. Could you imagine if you didn't have the choice to choose the grocery store that you buy your groceries at? Or you didn't have the opportunity to choose what department store you buy your clothes at? Or the opportunity to choose the salon or the barber shop, which obviously is a choice I haven't had to make in quite some time. <laughs> but in all seriousness, what we're talking about is creating voice, choice, and agency for all families. Teachers unions do kill our children's hopes and dreams, right? If you don't have hope, you can't dream. If you can't read, there's not much you can do, right? So if we're saying Black Lives Matter, if we're saying all are welcome here, that needs to start with education, a quality education. School choice is really about parental choice. This status quo has been going on for too long.
Senator Nick Frentz, chair of the Senate DFL Clean Energy and Climate Caucus, played a role in the success of the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act of 2021. I spoke with him this week for his perspective on the new law. Governor Walls has said he would like to eliminate greenhouse gases from electricity by 2040. How much closer to that goal does the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act of 2021 move the state? Well, first of all, thanks for the question, Shannon. Good to see you again. I'd say the ECO Act moves us about one step closer on about an eight step journey. So it's a positive, but it doesn't take us as far as we need to go. In the electric and energy sector, we can uh, decarbonize by 2040. As you've seen, President Biden's issued his goal by 2035. And also we've seen improvements across the sector in decarbonizing in particular with the introduction of wind and solar successfully, most people would say over the last 20 years. So the ECO Act, by virtue of its a promotion of utility efficiency, by its allowing for additional innovation to take place, which Americans are quite good at, I think it takes us part of the way, but not the whole way. And I think we'll take the remaining steps soon and I'm looking forward to the work on it. Uh, the law will reduce greenhouse gases through energy efficiency, thereby using fewer resources, which will likely save money to consumers. Is that essentially the gist? Yeah, and that's very well said. One of the things that you saw on the ECO Act that was most striking is a broad variety of stakeholder groups that supported it, among them utilities, including investor owned utilities, municipal utilities, rural co-ops, like I'm a customer of, and all of them said, if you let us do this, if you let us modernize the SIP program, conservation improvement program, we'll save ratepayers money and we'll reduce the need to produce energy for existing uses, which will decrease our carbon footprint. We also had environmental groups, labor, uh, different groups that said, hey, you should do this. And I'm glad to see it get done. Uh, how does new technology come into the picture? On the Senate floor, you spoke of demand side management and devices that are manufactured here in Minnesota. What are you talking about? Well, demand side management, for example, says we'll allow ratepayers to save some money and reduce the risk of brownouts when we decrease their air conditioning in July or when we say your heat's going down to 68 at a certain peak demand. So demand side managers says, as its name implies, we're going to manage the demand in order to make it easier for the energy generation to not go over the limit and to not get into the expensive parts of it. Um, another discussion for another time is what happened in Texas, where they found out if you don't have a steady, reliable supply, it can get quite costly. More on that in the next capital report. The devices that we manufacture in Minnesota and frankly across the country include things like technology that would shut your lights off when you're not in the room for a certain period of time. Things on your washing machine that will decrease the use of energy during certain periods or certain cycles. We're now allowing utilities to get some credit if they want or to offer rebates to their customers. And I think you'll see this come into play with electric vehicles as well, where if we want a utility can say, hey, we're going to incentivize the use of electric vehicles by giving you such and such rebate and allowing customers to pick and choose. So demand side management is something that's been talked about for a while and the ECO Act moves us forward, I would say in the right direction to allow those utilities to do that and hopefully save us some money. So relatedly, what are some of the green technologies that homeowners might invest in? You've said a few. How might heating and cooling empowering our homes and businesses change in the coming years? Sure. Well, that's a great question. And I, I would see three basic ways Minnesotans might watch for the answer. One, of course, is increased building efficiency when we build them. So when we build someone a home, we can put energy efficiency technology into it, something as simple as insulation or something that relates to, again, some of the devices that we've talked about on heating. Heat pumps is a technology that the eco bill allows for a greater use of. That, of course, is essentially going away from burning uh, a carbon emitting fuel, picture natural gas, to uh, heat transfer, electric. You know, that's one way we can do it. We want that to be cost competitive as well as to be carbon reduction. And we also are seeing geothermal. This is not quite here yet for the masses, but it's a technology that people are excited about for the two basic things that it's efficient, it costs less, and we believe it can provide a stable a heat source for Minnesota homes, ironically, by drilling into the ground. Stay tuned on geothermal. We had some other bills come through where we thought there was some promise, and I'm hoping that we'll still see some additional looking at that technology. 
This bill had broad support from both sides of the aisle and from a wide range of advocates and interest groups. You've already referenced that. that it's no small feat in the current political climate. How was this accomplished? What lessons could we take into future negotiations with changes in law? Well, I appreciate that question. You know, as a member of the minority in the Senate, I, I couldn't help but notice that ECO had some broad support, and yet we had some trouble getting it across the finish line a year ago. So if your question is, what lessons can we learn? Allow me to just say, we had some legislators, including myself, Senator Jason Rarick, and others who were willing to cross party lines to say, hey, what do you need to get X votes? It was significant for the Senate DFL in that this was a bill the Senate majority brought forward without enough votes of their own to pass it. So I wouldn't say it was unique, but it was unusual for um, us to be in a situation where we needed to put up a certain amount of votes. I will say that in the bill's first uh, hearing on the floor, it barely passed. And as you may know, came back then later and garnered greater support. And so if I had one lesson to share with your viewers, Shannon, I'd say that's exactly what you want to see. And I could get into the details about what changes were made and what negotiations were held. But the gist of it was members of both parties were willing to adjust the bill in order to get more votes. That's really what should go on. And I think the lesson's obvious. We can do some good things for Minnesota and for the United States of America, if anyone in Washington, D.C. is listening, if we look across the aisle and if it isn't a sin to talk to a member of another party. Uh, as the Senate DFL lead on clean energy and climate change, what is the next issue that could possibly garner this level of bipartisan support? Well, I'd be psyched if I thought there was another issue that could garner this level of bipartisan support. I don't know that one's on the radar, but I will give you um, my take as one legislator out of 201 about what I think we should be looking at. First of all, we've decarbonized in the energy and electric generation sector somewhat. That's good. Transportation, industry, we really haven't made much progress. Just take transportation. Biofuels is something that gets a lot of discussion. We had Senator Tina Smith in Mankato and we did an event yesterday to talk about biodiesel. I would like to think that members of both parties see the obvious advantages to a fuel that is cleaner and that we grow right here in Minnesota. Seems like a simple two-part benefit. There was not enough support to get biofuels, in particular E15 ethanol, across the finish line this session, even though it had a pretty widespread support and had some push from the governor, who, as you know, formed a biofuels council and made some bipartisan recommendations. I think what will change in the next year and, and going on is the realization that climate change is a real threat and that we have to do something. And as I've said, once we agree how much of a hurry we're in, I think it'll be easier for bipartisan support to say, okay, we'll do this. Um, but I, I think to be fair and honest with your viewers, and what other kind of guests do you have, Shannon? Um, we don't really have the next thing which will show this level of bipartisan support. And I, I don't know that um, we have members running around the Senate saying, well, this is definitely the next thing we're gonna agree on. We still have some wide disagreements on the severity of climate change. And we also have individual industries which are um, more concerned about change. Propane, for example, if you're in the propane industry, no, you're not excited about transferring to electric fuels. You like delivered fuels. And I understand that. And those are just the same type of Minnesotans as all the rest of us. It's just they have a different economic interest. Um, on the other hand, that's part of why they send legislators up to St. Paul is to try to slug these things out and get a result that's good for the whole state. And I really think we can do it with some more discussion, like on Capitol Report. Well, with that, Senator Nick Frentz, I always enjoy talking to you. Thank you so much. You too. Thank you, Shannon. Working group on the omnibus housing bill met recently to hear from property managers and housing advocates about the proposed off-ramp for the eviction moratorium. Unfortunately, we are seeing a very common issue that was the norm for tenants before the pandemic. Many financial aid programs do not provide assistance timely enough to prevent displacement. The focus of this work group cannot be on when more evictions begin, but rather when assistance can be easily secured to keep renters housed. Some say they, there won't be a rush to the courthouse with this process, 
We want to believe that, but without meaningful guide, guardrails, it's wishful thinking. I am just worried about the realities of the people in Minnesota. Um, this program just opened up on April 20th, and very little money has gone out the door, as you've heard today. And, you know, it's very difficult to navigate for renters. It's very difficult to navigate for landlords. And we, and therefore, any off-ramp plan needs to incorporate the realities of today. We have 1,800 homes in the state. We do homeless youth housing, homeless family, affordable housing, market rate, and so forth. We have 82 applications in the system right now. And I need you to understand one point first. That's 306,107 in past due rent with just those 82 applicants. If you don't understand how much we as owners and managers are dying right now, I need you to understand 82 applicants. This is not once we did. They came in, we set up our properties, we have given them letter after letter after letter. So notices, um, let me tell you, many. We have killed a few trees with the paper we have been sending out. We this moratorium, if it extends, allows these people to run amok in our hotel world, not just our apartment world, and then the, the things we're experiencing now in the, in the apartment world, what, we got 20% of these people that owe us money, which is 80 people out of four or 500 people right now, 20% of them will not comply with filling out the paperwork. They won't comply because they know that they have been employed all last year and they know they will not give us their W-2. Or their pay stubs. Or their, pay, or their current pay stubs. And we know they're working. We follow them. As someone who works with the people most impacted by the pandemic, I have witnessed the pandemic destabilize the lives of Minnesotans. Tenants have lost jobs. Many have lost uh, their lives. And some... Um, and many would have lost their homes if it weren't for the eviction moratorium. For example, I am here today with a grandmother who cares for her seven-year-old son who would absolutely be evicted for non-payment of rent if it weren't for the eviction moratorium. Typically, families in our housing have a hard enough time finding stable, dignified, and affordable housing, and evictions on their records will only make future stability harder. I think everyone here knows that. Early off-ramp will lead to high displacement and increased rates of homelessness, which our, our city, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul are already struggling with. My primary concern with the end of the moratorium is that we get flooded by so many cases that we are not able to provide the services that everyone needs. No one benefits from a messy and chaotic process that would be created if too many eviction cases are allowed to proceed at the same time. And while the eviction process is relatively quick in Minnesota, it is still a process that takes time and each step needs to proceed carefully, appropriately, and correctly. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.